My name is Andy Douglas. This is my husband, Jamie. He, uh, um, I'm the director of research on knowing. He's the chief scientist. He just retired from Boeing in January. And this is his language workbench. And then Alyssa Pavao is from Western, and she is working on our open source project as well. Um, we're all about reinventing computer programming to revolutionize how we learn, understand, and create. And our principle is that all computing is language, and all language is communication. And so you can look at any program and say, what is this programmer trying to communicate? You can abstract that, and then you can project it out into domain-specific languages, which is very important. And I'm going to let Jamie continue with that thought. So our open source project is, is language of languages, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, about how to um, bootstrap this uh, project. You might want to sit, uh, uh, okay. sit on, uh, sit on uh, move your chair over there so you won't block people seeing the screen there. Huh? Thanks. So um, this project, uh, just let me give you a little bit of background. This project is, is really in its infancy. So it's really great. We have uh, a, a minimal viable product out there that we can get started to use. And we're in the uh, process of trying to develop a community and get people involved with this project. There's lots of places to plug into it, both technically and non-technically. Uh, we can use lots of help, and all are welcome. So. Uh, let me give just a little bit of motivation for why you'd want to have something like a language workbench. What kind of big application areas would you like to work on? One of those is legacy application modernization. So you have a lot of, of, of legacy applications that are sitting out there. They are put together by very good teams. And now it's moved to a point where uh, no one uh, from the original team, except one person who just refused to move and change jobs, is left. And they don't know all of this code, and they're just praying with fingers crossed that it doesn't break and that they won't have to try to go in and fix it. And then you come along and you say, gee, we need to take and move this out of the data center into a cloud computing environment. Well, that's more than just taking and moving it uh, by changing the language that it's written in. That's certainly a part of it, but there's much more than that. You have to think about the libraries that are involved, the operating system that's underneath, and all the changes that have gone on with that. There's changes in architecture. Some of these are very old systems. I've still seen systems being looked at today where they said, what are we going to do about the JCL? Then you also have the data that has to be translated. Completely different kinds of architectures for how data is represented and handled. So let's say that you had a way to deal with all of this kind of complexity and translate it across. You'd have to be able to be able to test it to actually see that it really did work the way it was supposed to. How many legacy systems do you think have automated test suites? Not many. So the creation of those test suites are, are essential. Now you start mixing in other things like you know, mobile devices, wearable devices. Uh, what do you do with something that's uh, using old-styled IBM panel uh, uh, forms that are filled out and, and sent into a, an application and uh, you want to do something using uh, Google Glasses. And you don't really want to wind up in this situation where you do this modernization of the application and then you turn around and you have to now do it all over again for yet another iteration of new hardware and and uh, technology changes. So how do you take a, an application and elevate it up so that you've got a model that represents the business logic that you can then take and uh, 
project out onto a, a, a new uh, technology. So this is a, a huge uh, uh, problem. The amount of code that's out there is astronomical that, that suffers from this uh, uh, problem. Um, teams of people working years can work on one of these with high risk, high cost, high failure rate. You have pretty much the same results if you decide to um, do a legacy or a uh, COTS uh, solution. So you go over and say, well, we'll just abandon our stuff and we'll buy off the shop stuff and, and we'll do it there. You're throwing away a company's uh, developed IP for how they're going to do their business process in favor of somebody else's uh, solution. And the failure rates on projects that are done that way are uh, almost as high. So a uh, language translation pro uh, approach has been proven to be uh, uh, fairly uh, cost effective and uh, successful. A lot of the code that's out there today that deals with modeling climate change is written in Fortran. Uh, so you have a lot of legacy applications, if you will, that are in, uh, struggled with uh, uh, in that one uh, domain. It's hard for me to believe that it wouldn't be better to have a high level modeling language that was specific to things like climate change where you could do data integration and visualization and where you could actually think about moving the types of modeling that's being done to 3D gaming collaboration environments like the one you see below here which is done by uh, Cobalt or the uh, uh, was also referred to as uh, uh, Croquet. Uh, you know, these kinds of changes in technology uh, availability come along, being able to respond to them is a daunting task. You also have people who, like Brent and Victor, are proposing a new vision for how you could do programming with uh, highly responsive systems, live scripting, uh, and that. If you haven't seen any of Brett Victor's work, if you go to uh, worrydream.com, he has excellent uh, uh, presentation. This one here about inventing on principle that he's done is a, a favorite of mine. But if you're trying to do these large problems, the legacy system problem, uh, dealing in a domain like uh, climate change, or just trying to pursue a future vision for how programming ought to be done, a language workbench can be actually um, uh, very helpful. So like I said before, we're bootstrapping uh, language of languages as a, a language workbench. And so this presentation is actually going to go through and give you an idea of what's, what's this uh, approach of a language workbench like. The first thing is what is a domain-specific language? So domain-specific languages are just unlike general purpose programming languages targeted on a very specific application area. So an example would be uh, if you had a language that allowed you to put together a questionnaire survey and it, and it was working at that level. You can't use that kind of language to do general scientific programming. But it's very well suited to that very narrow area of doing a question survey. Uh, a language workbench is basically an environment that just makes it easy to create and use domain specific languages. So let's just take a look here about how we got in this mess. If you go back to the beginning, you had a domain problem. How do I multiply these two matrices? And that was translated into machine language. Very slow, tedious, and error prone. Does anybody see the error in the code? 
very quickly they came up with the idea of let's have this assembly code. Let's have symbolic ways of representing the instructions for the machine language. So SOAP is one of the early uh, assembly languages and it does pretty much a one-to-one -one translation here. That made it a lot better, but it's still slow, still tedious, still error prone. First language to come along was Fortran. And this actually represented a 4x improvement productivity over assembly language. But it wasn't universally received as a great thing. In fact, Van Neumann, actually, you know, famous for the Van Neumann architecture, really didn't see why you'd want to have any other language than uh, machine language. And uh, he was furious at somebody who was actually wasting computer cycles by implementing an assembler. So now going to today, you can insert your favorite language. And if you look at the productivity of these languages, you can see that they're incrementally improved, but in their same realm as Fortran. However, if you look at a domain-specific language, you can see a huge jump in productivity. Oops. Went backwards, sorry. So you can get this order of magnitude improvement over Fortran or 40x over assembly language. But in order to get that improvement, you really need to have a language workbench, and that language workbench has to have a, a meta language. And the reason why it needs that is it takes an awful lot of time and a lot of resources to create the kind of compilers, development tools, and that to support a language. Uh, it's, uh, so think about being on a team and uh, and that team is working in a particular language. It's a real rare occurrence. Well, anybody will even think that maybe we could make advance our project or help our project if we could just make this change to the compiler. Okay. Nobody wants to touch that. Okay. And that's because it's just way too risky. There's too much uh, expense and difficulty with it. Well, the whole idea of a language workbench is to overcome that difficulty, to reduce that cost and time. So how does a language workbench exactly work? Well, the, uh, the traditional way of doing a translation is really to focus on the source and the target language. So we actually go over and start looking at uh, a uh, how do I take, for example, Fortran and actually put it into in, into SOAP, the uh, target language. Over the years, this is. Tr uh, transition to really a focus on how do I do the syntax and semantic analysis to create an abstract syntax tree and then how do I do from that uh, abstract syntax tree code generation. A language workbench actually kind of turns this upside down. It takes the focus, the main focus of what it's dealing with as being that internal representation, something like an abstract syntax tree. And then it actually looks at both the source and the objects as just projections of that, just a visualization of that internal representation. So how do you take an edit or create this abstract syntax tree-like structure and then how can you project that out? Now, if you take that view, you can add other languages that come off of that same structure. So which is the real program here? All of these at the bottom 
are just visualizations of this same kind of tree structure. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to work on the one that's over here instead of the one that's on the far side, on the, let's see, what is it, your right side? So our project is language of languages, and we had some very specific focus for this project. One thing is that we, we wanted it to have, um, uh, uh, to be free. There's nothing to buy. Nobody has to go in and convince a manager to come up with 50 bucks or 200 bucks or 2,000 bucks in order to get it. It's open source, so everything's accessible. You can, you can see all the code. Uh, we wanted to have it available as a, a software as a service. Uh, that's important because there's nothing to download, nothing to install. You don't have, if you're working at a company, you don't have to go over and check with them about installing something on a company machine. Okay, works right straight through the browser. And it's also client side. And that's very important because we're not talking about any of the IP that you have represented in code traveling off of your desk over to a server somewhere where it, something could happen to it. Everything's local, okay? Uh, our objective here is to really make the barrier to entry to use this tool as low as possible. Also, it's, not, uh, it's a tool that can be used by just one person to do some one task. So it's not even a matter of having to convince a team or, uh, or uh, a department that, oh, here's a tool we ought to use. You can use the tool to do a specific thing that you were interested in. So what I'm going to do next here is actually just show you this. So this is, uh, this is our current uh, release. And uh, the resolution here is uh, for our video is, is, is uh, a low resolution uh, VGA display. I'm sure nobody's going to have problems reading this. This comes up here as just a, a, a workbench link off of our uh, language of languages website. And it has this banner. Uh, this area here is the language ri uh, uh, ribbon, and it comes up by default in a little example here called Getting Started, which actually just has a, a really simple thing. It has uh, uh, a math uh, problem that you can enter. It's going to actually calculate it. It'll print out the a AST structure, which for us is a language element tree, a let. Um, and down here, is actually the grammars. These, these windows here can be collapsed. So if I want to collapse all of these here, I can see this. And so, um, let's see, I'll just scroll this up a bit. So here's a really simple grammar. So <coughs> our grammar for math shows that we have expressions, we have terms, which adding, subtracting things, factors, multiplying, dividing things. You can put things in parentheses. And we just basically have numbers that are simple integers. And these uh, uh, types of, of, of items here, which represent a pretty standard kind of uh, meta language for uh, BNF type of grammar representations, that items can get bound to things like variables like the T and the F here. And then over here, with this little arrow, we show the generation of a language element. So for example, if I'm taking a term and I'm adding a factor to it, these get bound to T and F. And I create a little language element that says add TF. And this creates a tree structure. 
I can have a little calculate grammar here that actually goes in and just interprets this and does the, does the math operation. I can have a let grammar that goes over and says, well, let's indent by how deep you are in the tree and print out the node with its uh, components. Uh, and, and so this is just a little example, just uh, you know, trivial kind of textbook example for showing how you could do this type of thing. So just to show that it actually, the computer actually can still do math, we'll go in here. And so I changed this, and all the affected windows here are changed. And if I go over here and just refresh all of them, it now shows me how this has been uh, changed. Uh, I can. Uh, Do something like that, and here I have not only the answer, but I also have this tree structure that's printed out as well. And these windows can be uh, changed. I can change the characteristics of them. Different windows can take input from other windows and process those. I can look at the languages that are being used here, such as my math language. I can add a language, which allows me to take and, and create a pipeline. So I can have multiple grammars that will parse out the result by successively refining it. So I'm, what I'm going to show what I'm going to show next here is uh, I'll just load a little grammar that I have. So this is a book that's used in a lot of um, uh, computer language uh, classes by Tucker. They use a little uh, a grammar called uh, for a language they call C light and uh, so I picked this up and if I look on uh, page 38 of this thing I have this one page that has this grammar so I just took and wrote the equivalent of this in our meta language called Ometa and Now it, it takes a little uh, C program I have here. Well, I'm not used to having this be so big on my screen. It kind of spooks me out. So, so here I have the, the grammar that's been specified there. And uh, uh, I picked this book up. Um, I, I probably, I, I spent probably about a little less than an hour and put that in. Uh, and now, uh, you know, if I, if I uh, create something here, let's see here if this is going to work on me. Nope. It says, gee, that's not right. I don't really care for semicolons. <laughs> so I leave them out. Anyway. So this is, uh, is kind of interesting to do this. And then it occurred to me, just a second, I took their grammar here and I translated it into our meta language. I've got a tool that does translation. Why am I doing that by hand? So what I did is I decided to go over and say, well, Let me just look out on the web and I'll pick up um, a grammar for doing, let's see, is that right? I get the right one. Yeah, that's it. For doing extended BNF. So, 
So here's a little grammar that does that and turns it into omega. Not too much different. You know, you have to have commas here at the end of these guys. You have to have um, uh, these brackets. So it's pretty close. However, they used something a little bit different in here. They used arrows instead of uh, instead of equal signs. And they also had it just be an end of a line. So what I did was I subsetted this grammar here for extended BNF and actually just put in the few rules here to do this translation. And now I can just take this just as it is here, except for I had to put quotation marks around the um, um, around the literals, and I can generate the Ometa uh, meta language for it. <coughs> then what I did was I looked a little bit further in this book, and they had their own. Uh, oh, that's not the right one. They had a definition for their uh, abstract syntax tree. So I took that recognizer and I added, oh, this is going to be a little bit difficult because of the resolution here. So to these things, I added the items to create the uh, abstract syntax tree. So a each of these items here has starts with a concept and then puts the children here that are related and uh, and builds out a, 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 a tree structure for the code. So now I can see here is the abstract syntax tree for a, a program. And then from this I can generate out code to uh, any language Another problem you can think about trying to solve uh, with this is think about if you had JSON and you were trying to map it into XML, or XML and you're trying to map it into JSON. That's not something that there's just one way to do that. Uh, this gives you a tool to just take those grammars and do that mapping uh, you know, fair, uh, fairly easy. And as you ha have a problem with your uh, project, you can just leverage the tool to uh, do translation. You could kind of think of this as sort of a, a syntax-driven, high-level editing of your code. Because uh, a grammar is usually round up being anywhere from like five you know, pages for Pascal up to you know, 22 pages for uh, C++. And if you're able to take and translate that kind of uh, 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 use those kinds of rules, just think uh, how you can use that for leverage against something like a, um, a large million line program. Okay. So going back to the problems, having a tool to be able to actually uh, attack problems like uh, climate change, create a domain specific language for modeling, do legacy modernization, or create a completely new um, um, programming environment. Um, this, is, this is just the tip of the iceberg of a language workbench to begin to help us uh, attack that kind of, 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 of problem. So our project's actually divided up into four areas. There is a uh, the bootstrapped um, workbench itself. We're looking at uh, people who are interested to add tools for like debugging or um, uh, other code um, uh, development uh, support tools. Uh, we are only doing text right now, but the tool is set up to be able to handle graphical representations, and we want to add that so that we can uh, uh, parse and translate things graphically. 
there's an area here to just define languages that can be shared and used. Uh, regular programming languages, your favorite language, domain specific languages, as well as then leverage all of this together to do an application. So uh, Alyssa here has been uh, part of our project, and I'll let her tell about her experience uh, working on uh, uh, the uh, op open source project with us. So they came to Western um, last year for a resume workshop, and uh, after they had done their presentation, after the we went over things, they I went and talked to them, and they talked about the language of languages, and I was interested in it, and so I asked, how can I get involved? And so I got in contact with them, and here I am. And I uh, worked on the um, the client side federated login, and that has presented a few challenges because it is client side, so we can't have the server. And so how do we do that? Um, I ended up finding um, a JavaScript API that's client side that can do a federated login, and so that's currently what I'm working on. Um, and I'm hoping to get like learn and demonstrate new skills, be able to enhance my computing portfolio and resume, and then um, also advancing language workbench technology, and then working on a fun open source project. So on, on May 9th, um, on Western's campus, in, on the Viking Union, there is gonna be an open source day to work on open source projects and to learn more about open source and get, um, that's gonna be from 9.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And it's free for students and $10 for non. And actually we're gonna be having the language of languages, um, there'll be a table for them to be able to work on. And we have a few other projects that we'll have tables for. Um, and if anyone is interested in sponsoring or mentoring, talk to me after or go to the AWC table that is out there um, to learn more. Well, like I said at the beginning here, um, uh, this project's just at the uh, at, at its birthing uh, moment here. Um, we're um, looking for people to get involved, to uh, participate and contribute, both technically, non-technically, on the project. There's lots of room to say, "Gee, you need this. I'm interested in it. Can I work on it?" and make a contribution. Uh, hopefully, to a project, I think. Could, has the potential to have a, a, a big effect on the future of computing. Oop, I clicked on that and it went backwards. So, uh, any questions? Right now, Jamie, the bane of my existence and most people that have <coughs> used your computer systems are patches and other security features because back when they developed assembly language and Fortran and all that, they did not try to build any type of security in. They were not thinking of the internet. And when you talk about using cloud, like software as a service, how do you envision things like digital signatures, hashing, and other security techniques being put into a software work? Uh, let's see. So I was with you there until the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in, in terms of... Uh, it's added on. It's, absolutely. It's attached on, and it's like... Sure. It is a mess when it's added on. So, so the workbench, uh, actually, we're getting to a point, the whole title of this thing was bootstrapping a language workbench. So the whole idea here is to get to a point where we're actually using the workbench to do the workbench. And so um, um, uh, part of the thrust here with uh, uh, you know, using domain-specific languages is you can actually keep elevating up the abstraction level that you're looking at the code. And uh, from that abstraction, high-level abstraction layer, you can actually generate out the application. Because what large part of the problem is that you go in with code and you say, oh, um, we have this C program and it has this pointer over here and that's how we're doing our strings. Ooh, uh, this is a security problem. So now we have to go through everywhere we've got pointers to, for, for strings 
and try to replace it with something else. Lots of work. However, if you get up where you have this high level description of your application and it's going to be using something like a string, you can go over and say, so this is how we're going to handle strings, not with pointers, but with an actual object that's encapsulated. And now you can generate the, out the whole application and it will put in all of those things just looking like a compile step. In fact, their Manoir, um, what's Manoir's last name? My, my dear, dear friend Manoir, who I don't remember his last name, <laughs> at the U University of Alabama actually uh, did his uh, PhD dissertation on that. Uh, and we worked with, with, with him um, with the idea of ad identifying security patterns and then how do you refactor code to then implement them. And the whole idea of having this high level abstract program representation you could project that is the, you know, I, I think is the way to go. Uh, so, um, you know, it, 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 it really changes uh, how you're thinking about, uh, about the code. Uh, we're so used to just thinking that the language level we're working in is being the code. This actually gets you into something that you can manipulate that's at a higher level that generates out the program. Um, and so you can address those kinds of problems. So, any other? Are you noticing any problems with like the more, uh, high, like the higher level language gets, the harder it is to resolve ambiguity of what the person means? Because I mean, a lot of, but just the higher languages I use, right, it just gets harder and harder. I just imagine that being a bigger problem once you get really high level. So, um, I, we haven't we we haven't really got to a point where you know there's there's a whole lot of stuff here that we have really high hopes for, but we don't have a track record to be able to really point to and say oh yeah this is not a problem. Um, um, I have noticed though uh, just using the tool myself for doing some of the examples and working you know as it we've just finally got it available here. Uh, um, that it, uh, it actually tends to uh, help surface some of the, and clarify some of the ambiguities. Because you start looking at the code in terms of these tree structure with these language elements, and you start thinking about the concepts that are involved. And, and uh, so when you look at a language um, um, element tree, a let, uh, uh, you can actually see, oh, this is this uh, concept that's being implemented here, and if I switch languages, that's how it's being done differently. That's what it, and that, and that translation is sort of the meaning, becomes the meaning. Uh, everybody can think about, oh, I have these programming concepts, right? But this makes it explicit to sort of list out what they are and see what they really translate out to mean. Uh, and, and so it actually, I think it, it helps clarify some of that. Um, uh, for example, most programming languages will go over and have a concept for uh, the idea of a function call. But do they actually have something that says, oh, this is a recursive function call. So here's the you know, initial condition, you know, termination condition, or this is tail recursion. Those are usually higher level concepts that programmers think about. If you actually start explicitly representing how that's translated and implemented, it kind of clarifies a lot of the ambiguities that way. And at least that's our hope. Let's see how it works out. <laughs> uh, how about correctness and validation? Uh, how do you handle that? Ah, the tools section. <laughs> So there is a whole need for, for um, being able to, to uh, do testing for grammars. And one of the neat things here is that um, working at this language level seems to have the same kind of characteristics like the um, uh, small talk programming environment had. And that is that you have a very few concepts that represent how things are done. So if there's an error there, it catastrophically fails everywhere 
really fast than you see it. But if you get them right, it, it, it really um, um, it is rare to have a problem. And, and, and so uh, this kind of falls in, in, in that realm. But the whole area of testing and validating grammars and, and, and that, uh, we, we want some tools to do uh, automatically generate test cases. In fact, for using, doing the legacy systems, one of the application areas I'm very interested in is be able to capture the code for uh, an application and then generate out a whole bunch of uh, test cases that uh, in scripts that you can run that will you can inspect to see oh this is what this code's doing uh, and you know will you know relieve you from the tedious task of going through and having coverage and testing all these things uh, and I think that's a really great application uh, you know area but that's that's. Like I said, that's one of the tool areas we'd love to see some people work on. There's a lot of room for, for work there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned sort of the, the net language. Um, how, how fully developed is that? Okay. So um, I, uh, let's see, back in 2008, worked with a graduate student over at uh, UCLA, Alex. Uh, um, oh, worth, um, and uh, I have this characteristic so I can never remember the uh, last how to pronounce the last names of my very close friends and colleagues, at least <laughs> when I'm giving presentations. Uh, uh, and uh, Alex uh, did Ometa as part of his uh, uh, dissertation. He actually worked at Viewpoints Research with Alan Kay, who uh, and. Um, and I got involved with him, and we wrote a paper together on uh, using this uh, to add left recursion. And, and so the uh, OMED has been used open source since then. There's been a lot of stuff through viewpoint research that's been done. It was part of the STEPS project from uh, Alan Kay's uh, uh, work there. Um, We've leveraged that for our language workbench here. We're making a few changes to it. Uh, we're switching it from a pack rat parser technique to a uh, shortcut parser, which is a kind of a cross between uh, uh, early parser and a pack rat parser. It, it does uh, um, it generates, recognizes the context-free uh, grammars um, and a little bit beyond. And it also does that without any ambiguity. So you're going to say, how does it do uh, without ambiguity? The way it does that is it, uh, it, it, it creates the uh, parses and it says the leftmost parse in any uh, uh, choice is the right one. <laughs> and so if you've ordered your rules and you put the thing that you want to give preference to and priority to first, that's the one that gets chosen. So anyway, there's those changes that we're making to it, plus adding in the let structure, but it's fairly stable. Uh, it's had a lot of people uh, developing languages online uh, with it, and uh, at least you know our experience so far is is that it's been you know pretty. Uh, 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 pretty uh, stable to work with. So, did that answer your question? Or? Yeah, so what you're saying is that if I want to documentation um, what Ometa does, I go to the Ometa book? Uh, and you can read the um, uh, dissertation that, that we have the, the dissertation that he created. And one of the projects I've got right now is actually to create documentation. In fact, that's a great area that somebody who knows about documentation could contribute to the project, my technical writer oh, friend, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody think that this is new? <laughs> So um, uh, 
you can create optimization um, uh, translators here. So as you recognize the let, you can do transformations of the tree into a new tree structure. So it's very easy to do all kinds of, of optimizations all the way from uh, you know, uh, uh, very local optimizations to large sweeping changes. In fact, the Ometa uh, translator is written in Ometa itself and has an optimization uh, phase which uh, uh, you know, does things like insert jump table, um, uh, you know, elimination and uh, inlining of code and all kinds of optimizations that way. So it's actually pretty, uh, you know, pretty nice uh, in environment to work in. Most of the time when you're doing like compiler creation, uh, at least in the past, I mean, uh, the amount of tools that you had to use and try to cobble together were pretty large. We're able uh, to do pretty much everything that we're doing here within Ometa because it actually embeds uh, the use of, of small uh, code fragment uh, uh, insertion with JavaScript. So, um, you know, it's uh, really, really been able to do sort of the whole thing, you know, nuts to soup. Any other questions? If not, uh, we're going to be available to talk with people here. Uh, love to, uh, uh, since it's going to be lunch here, if people want to join us to talk further at lunch, we'd be glad to uh, have you, uh, uh, you know, join us. And, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, lunch started downstairs at 1130, so you're able to go down and get there if you want. Um, we're at the sandwich shop, so we're going to be in the cafeteria. Yeah, if you want to find us, we'll be in the cafeteria. So, great. Thanks very much. Thanks.